So welcome to the last lecture of Math 111T this quarter. Uh, today what I'm going to do is I will uh, sketch the proof of the quartic formula showing how invariant polynomials go into the solution of a general quartic, which means degree 4 polynomial. And then I'm going to introduce the basic idea of Galois theory, which kind of came out of this study of uh, invariant functions and solution of polynomial equations, how group theory kind of entered into this theory of uh, solving equations. Uh, at the end, I'll show you some kind of more modern, interesting computational uh, aspects of Galois theory. Here we go. To begin today, let's look at the quartic equation, degree 4 equation, which I've put in monarch form as x to the fourth plus ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals 0. And I'm not going to go through every detail on how do you solve this quartic, but I'll give you kind of a sketch of how it goes. And the start of this is just like we did for the quadratic and the cubic. We can express this polynomial, at least if we factor it uh, using complex numbers. So if we allow uh, working in the complex numbers, then this polynomial factors as x minus r1. Every irreducible factor is linear. And we can factor the quartic polynomial as a product of four linear polynomials of the form x minus r1, x minus r2, x minus r3, x minus r4. This equals zero. So r1, r2, r3, r4 are the roots of the polynomial. And if we equate these two things, the coefficient of x to the fourth is one, the coefficient of x to the fourth is one. Down here, the coefficient of x cubed is going to be negative r1 plus r2 plus r3 plus r4. And so we find a system of four equations, in fact. The first equation is r1 plus r2 plus r3 plus r4. That will end up being the coefficient of x cubed, well, negative. So this will be negative a. And then if we take the coefficient of x squared, that will be obtained by taking two r's and two x's. And there are, I think, six ways of doing this. So we'll find that r1, r2 plus r1, r3 plus r1, r4 plus r2, r3 plus r2, r4 plus r3, r4 will equal b. The coefficient of x will be obtained by taking an x and three of the r's, and there's uh, four ways of doing that. We'll find that r1, r2, r3 plus r1, r3, r4 plus r1, r2, r4 plus r2, r3, r4. That will equal negative c. And then for d, it's the product of the four roots. This equals d. And on the left side of these equalities, these are all the these are the fundamental S4 invariant polynomials. And every S4 invariant polynomial can in fact be expressed in terms of these. So remember in the quadratic case, one idea to solve the quadratic equation was to look at the quantity, which was the difference of the two roots, and notice that a squared was invariant. And so a squared could be expressed in terms of the fundamental invariant polynomials, which was then related to the coefficients. In the cubic case, instead of a single a, we had two a's, well, an a and a b. We had r1 plus omega r2 plus omega squared r3, the sum of the three roots, but with these cube roots of unity. And b was the similar thing using omega squared and omega. And in this case, a cubed plus b cubed was invariant. 
So in the quartic case, the trick is to use three different things. We'll call them capital A, B, and C. A will be R1, R2 plus R3, R4. B is going to be R1, R3 plus R2, R4. And C will be R1, R4 plus R2, R3. Now notice these will satisfy a lot of nice identities. For example, if I sum them all up, I get little b here. I get this invariant polynomial. So this, in fact, is an invariant polynomial. But I get something kind of cool, which is that, in fact, not only this, but the other S3 invariant expressions in capital A, B, and C are also invariant. So if I look at A times B times C, what is this? Well, this will be invariant. And if I look at this polynomial, AB plus BC plus CA, this is also S4 invariant. And any S4 invariant polynomial can be expressed in terms of these fundamental ones, which are expressed in terms of these coefficients, little a, little b, little c, and little d. So as a consequence of all this, uh, here's what you can deduce. So a plus b plus c, a, b plus b, c plus c, a, and a times b times c are expressible in terms of the original coefficients. And we're led to consider the polynomial which is called the resolvent cubic. I'll make myself a little more space here. We're led to consider the resolvent cubic, which has the form z minus a times z minus b times z minus c. Because this polynomial has the form z cubed minus a plus b plus c uh, z squared plus a b plus b c plus c a z then minus a, B, C. Now this might seem sort of strange, but what's going on here is that these numbers here, these all can be expressed as some mess involving A, B, C, D. Well, A plus B plus C is, is the easier one. That's equal to little b. And this one and this one, I don't know off the top of my head, but this is some A, B, C, D mess, and so is this one. So this is a polynomial that can actually be written down in terms of the original polynomial. My original polynomial had coefficients a, b, c, d. This is a cubic polynomial whose coefficients are some expressions involving a, b, c, d. And we have a cubic formula already. Remember, we proved that last time. We can solve this cubic. And since we can solve the cubic, we can actually find a, B, and C. Those are the roots of the cubic. Since we can solve cubics, we can find A, B, and C. Okay, so that's sort of step one. And then we're almost done. I'll show you in just a minute.
So where we left off was with the solution of a quartic by solving what's called the resolvent cubic. Now, if I want to be very explicit about this, I could also reduce my quartic to depressed monic form. In other words, I could get rid of that cubic term by doing a substitution. So let's, if we want to solve a monic depressed quartic of this form, x to the fourth plus px squared plus qx plus s. So this has roots r1, r2, r3, r4. Then what I do is I let a, b, and c be these combinations of uh, r1, r2 plus r3, r4, r1, r3 plus r2, r4, and then r1, r4 plus r2, r3. And then uh, the symmetric cubic functions in a, b, and c end up being related to the original coefficients. And if you want to make this explicit, this is why I made it depressed to make it a little simpler in the formulaic uh, in the formula here, what happens is that a, b, and c are roots of the cubic polynomial z cubed, this is a cubed, z cubed minus 2pz squared plus p squared minus 4sz plus q squared. So since we can solve cubics using the cubic equation, we can find a, b, and c. So while we don't have the roots r1, r2, r3, r4 individually yet, we do have these combinations of roots called capital A, capital B, and capital C. Okay, so now what do we do? How do we actually find the individual roots? The next step is to notice that, uh, let's take the polynomial If I take the polynomial, I've used an x, I've used a z, let's take a y. If I take y minus r1, r2 times y minus r1, r3, and I multiply this out, this is y squared minus r1, r2, sorry, this I meant r3, r4. Let me make that neat. So the linear term will be minus r1, r2 plus r3, r4 times y. That's a. And then the uh, constant term is r1, r2, r3, r4. But the product of all these roots is the final coefficient here, which here I've called s. So plus s, coefficient of my original quartic polynomial. And this is a quadratic polynomial. I know what capital A is. I know what little s is. So I can find the roots of this quadratic polynomial by using the quadratic formula. So I can express these roots, r1, r2, and r3, r4, using the quadratic formula in terms of capital A and capital S. You know, so for example, these numbers will be equal to negative b, which is a here, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is a squared minus 4s all over 2 or something. Those with a plus or minus, that will give me the value of r1, r2, and r3, r4. In terms of numbers that I've already found, I've already found capital A and little s was given to me from the beginning. Okay, so now I can solve this quadratic to find these things. And I can do the same for, so those were those two. I can also find r1, r3, r2, r4, r1, r4, and r2, r3. So what this means is that I can now find not the individual roots, but the products of all pairs of roots, like r1, r2, r3, r4, r2, r4, etc. And now it's not too hard to find what r1 is, for example, we can finish with something like r1 squared. Well, r1 squared will be r1 r2 times r2 r1 r3 divided by r2 r3. Just observe that this times this divided by this it leaves me with an r1 squared. 
And therefore, I can express R1 as the square root of this, I guess, plus or minus. Okay, and the same thing for R2 and R3 and R4. So there are some subtleties in this process because when you're solving cubics, you need to make sure, well, which one is A, which one is B, which one is C, which of the roots. Here there's a plus or minus that you have to resolve. Here there's a plus or minus that you have to resolve. But if you do it all carefully, you have a formula then for the roots of this polynomial. Like R1 will be expressed as something involving a square root of these things. And these things will be expressed in terms of A, B, and C and some square roots. And A, B, and C will be expressed in terms of roots of a cubic. So you might have square roots and cube roots. So the quartic formula in the end involves kind of a square rooting step here, a square rooting step here. And for solving the cubic, I'll need some cube roots as well and some square roots. Okay, so this is uh, how the proof works for the quartic formula. If you actually want to go through it, there's a lot of little details in there, but this is the basic idea of using some polynomials, A, B, and C, which aren't invariant by themselves, but their product is, and their sum is, and in fact, A, B plus B, C plus C, A. Those are all invariant, so they're expressible in terms of coefficients, and that lets you kind of solve an equation and get go forward with it. Uh, you might wonder what goes on if you go from quartic to quintic. There is a resolvent polynomial, but it turns out that the resolvent polynomial of a quintic equation is a sextic equation. It's degree six. So instead of going down a degree, you go up a degree, and the method kind of fails from the beginning. But something does tell you more about what makes this work, which is that if you track the roots through carefully here, there's a square root at this last step, a square root here. In the cubic formula, there's a square root and a cube root. There's a two, a two, a three, and a two in the roots. And two times two times three times two is 24. And this happens to be the cardinality of S4. So there's actually some group theoretic structure with the group S4 that guarantees that you can solve the equation using square roots and cube roots. In fact, three square roots and one cube root suffice. So I want to show you the group theory part next, and then we'll uh, see this thing called the Galois group that shows up all over mathematics. So I want to return to group theory to show you some group theoretic things that correspond to the solubility of the quartic equation. And the key idea is the idea of a solvable group, which is called a solvable group because uh, polynomials uh, associated to such groups are solvable by uh, formulas involving addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and roots. So let's stay within group theory just for a moment. Let's take the group S4. S4 has a subgroup called A4. Uh, the cardinality of S4 is 24, by the way. The cardinality of A4 is 12. A4 is the subgroup of even permutations. These are the permutations whose cycle type is either 1, 1, 1, 1, in other words, it's the identity, 3, 1, in other words, it's like a, a three cycle together with one fixed point, or a double two cycle. If I look inside of A4, there's a subgroup which I call K4. The K4 has three elements, or sorry, four elements, the identity, and all the uh, two, two cycles. So one, two, three, four is a double two cycle, one, three, two, four, and one, four, two, three. And then K4 has a subgroup, which doesn't really have a name. It has the identity and just take any one of these, like one, two, three, four. And then this has a subgroup, which is the trivial subgroup. So here I've written down the cardinalities of the groups involved. Now this tower of subgroups, each one is contained in the next. So S4 contains A4, contains K4, contains this two element subgroup, contains the identity. So 
S4 has what I call a tower of subgroups. And it has the property that each each is what's called a normal subgroup of the next. So let me just remind you what the definition of normal is. Maybe we covered this earlier, but if we did, it was very brief. We say, uh, generally in group theory, we say that a group, a subgroup H of a group G This is a normal subgroup if, first, H is a subgroup of G, so you re remember these axioms for subgroups. It has the identity, it has inverses of all of its elements, and it's closed under the group law, uh, SG1, SG2, and SG3, and the normal property says that if we conjugate something in H by something in G, we stay within H. So writing this out for all G in G and little h in big H, we have uh, G H G inverse is in H. So this I might not call two, maybe I should call this property N or something. This is the defining property of normal subgroups that if you take something in the subgroup, you conjugate it by something in the group, we end up in the subgroups. And what happens here is that not only is each one of these a subgroup of the next, each one is a normal subgroup of the next. A4 is a normal subgroup of S4, and K4 is a normal subgroup of A4, in fact, it's a normal subgroup of S4, but that's not really relevant here. And this next group, this is a normal subgroup of K4, and just the identity is a normal subgroup of the one above it containing the identity, and one, two, three, four. So this is a tower of subgroups. Each one is a normal subgroup of the next, and it satisfies one other kind of cool property. So, and if we look at the cardinalities, the quotients of the cardinalities are all prime numbers. So 24 divided by 12 is 2, and 12 divided by 4 is 3, and 4 divided by 2 is 2, and 2 divided by 1 is 2. These are all prime numbers, 2, 3, 2, and 2. In this case, If we have a tower of subgroups like this, if we have a group with a tower of subgroups where each one is normal in the next, and all of the quotients of the cardinalities are prime numbers, we say that G is solvable. This is the group theoretic word, solvable. So this tower here shows that S4 is a solvable group. And the upshot of this so or the fact that S4 is solvable
since S4 is solvable as a group, it has this tower of normal subgroups where every quotient of cardinality is its prime. This turns out to be equivalent to the fact that we can solve any quartic equation, degree four equation, by using only the usual operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Division actually makes sense in any field as long as I don't divide by zero, so this is kind of a, a legitimate operation. And uh, square roots and cube roots. So let me just say p roots, where p is among the prime numbers in the tower. So in this case, for S4, the prime numbers are 2, 3, well, 2, and 2. So we need to use square roots and cube roots in order to solve the general quartic equation. You might wonder, wonder where fourth roots are, but square roots of square roots are fourth roots, so you don't ever have to worry about fourth roots. So this is Galois' discovery. This is... Galois' discovery is that this group theoretic property group theoretic solvability tells us about solvability of polynomials. This was his great discovery. Now, I'm saying this in modern language because the idea of a group did not exist until after Galois. In fact, Galois sort of invented a fair amount of group theory in order to study the solvability of polynomials. And now in retrospect, and his work wasn't really understood and kind of incorporated into uh, most mathematicians' education until 50 years, at least until after his death. But his discoveries in group theory, uh, his invention really of group theory, made a link between uh, the permutations of the roots, which uh, give a group, and the solvability of polynomials. Now, uh, Abel, and uh, after some earlier work by Ruffini, Abel proved that the fifth degree polynomial, the quintic polynomial, was not solvable using these operations with roots. Uh, Abel didn't use group theory, but after Galois, it became understood that it's really a group theoretic property of S5. The fact that, in fact, S5 this is a group, it's kind of a big group it has 120 elements the permutation group of 5 elements is not solvable S5 does not have a tower of subgroups where each one is a normal subgroup of the one above it and where all the quotient groups uh, all the quotient cardinalities are prime numbers. And therefore, this is something that I do in my graduate algebra class, the general quintic equation cannot be solved using operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and pth roots for, uh, well, any roots really, but pth roots suffice for p prime. So even if I allow myself square roots and cube roots and fifth roots and seventh roots and whatever else, I'm not going to ever find a quintic formula. And so the theorem is that if the group Sn is not solvable, then in fact you'll never be able to write down a general formula to solve an nth degree polynomial equation, at least not using these algebraic operations. Uh, in fact, this is true for S5 
S6 is also not solvable, so there's no general sextic equation. S7 is not solvable. In fact, uh, for n greater than or equal to 5, Sn is not solvable. So the same conclusion holds in degree 5 and higher. It doesn't mean that there's no general formula for solving a quintic, because there, in fact, is a formula for solving a quintic using some transcendental functions, so things that come out of uh, calculus and more advanced calculus courses. But in terms of algebraic operations, you're never going to find a quintic formula. So to finish, I want to show you one more place where group theory meets factorization, and it's connected to the little sketch of Galois theory that I just gave. And I think the best way to see this is by looking at an example. Let's take the example of the polynomial x to the fourth plus x plus two. So I'll erase this for a second. So this polynomial, it's irreducible if we think about it as a polynomial with rational coefficients. There's no way to factor this into uh, two lower degree polynomials if we're working with rational coefficients. Of course, if you wanted to work with complex coefficients, this would factor as x minus the first root, x minus the second root, third root, fourth root, it would factor into linear factors. But if we're only allowed rational coefficients, then this polynomial cannot be factored. So this is a, a quartic polynomial. Let's also look at how it might factor in these finite fields in F2, F3, F5, and so on. And what I mean by that is that the coefficients are 1, 1, and 2, and each of these can be interpreted in these fields. For example, 2 is equal to 0 in F2. 2 is 1 plus 1, or, or 2 bar, in this field, and that's equal to 0. So in F2, the constant term is 0, so this factors then as x times 1 plus x cubed. And x cubed plus 1 can also be factored, so this ends up being x times x plus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. This is the irreducible factorization. x, x plus 1, and x squared plus x plus 1, these are all irreducible polynomials in F2 bracket x. And I can do this, instead of an F2, I can do this with all these other finite fields. And if I look over F3, then it turns out that it's irreducible. The irreducible factorization is just P itself. If I work over F5, so the field of five elements, then the polynomial factors and it factors as a linear polynomial, x minus 2. You can pull that out because 2 to the 4th is 16, plus 2 is 18, plus 2 is 20. And 20 bar is 0 bar, so 2 is a root of the polynomial over f5. And it factors as this, times a cubic, and the cubic is x cubed plus 2x squared uh, minus x minus 1. And that happens to be irreducible. So this is the irreducible factorization in F5 bracket x. And I'll just write up the ones for uh, 7, it's irreducible. And 11, it's irreducible. In F13, it's irreducible. In F17, it factors again as a linear times a cubic, so it factors as, in this case, negative 6 is a root, mod 17. You have x plus 6 times uh, some mess, I think it's uh, x cubed, minus 6x squared, plus 2x, plus 6. So this is in f. 17. So let's look at this in terms of patterns of factorization. So the patterns, by the pattern I mean what are the degrees of the irreducible factors? So what I find is that the degrees uh, that I find are, well in this case I find degree 1, 1, and 2, 
In this one, I find just degree four FP itself. Here I find degree four, I'm sorry, here I find degree one and degree three. Here I find degree four, degree four, degree four, and a degree one factor and a degree three factor. And the way I wrote these up quickly is that I actually asked my computer to find them. So I'll show you what the little computer program does that, uh, that figures out these factor patterns. So I like using Python. I'm using a fairly basic Python package called SimPy. I'm not using anything too fancy. This is kind of a standard Python package. I'll upload this notebook in case you want to program it. Uh, I'm using this package SimPy because SimPy allows you to work with polynomials. So I'm importing SimPy, this package. I'm saying that uh, x is my variable. Here I've just factored x squared minus 1 just to test that it all works. Here I'm looking at my polynomial x to the fourth plus x plus 2. The next lines actually generate a list of prime numbers. I think the first thousand prime numbers, just to kind of keep those in memory, the first one is 2. So I'd start with f2 and the last one would be f7919. And the next thing I do is I use SimPy to find a list of the irreducible factors of the polynomial modulo p, when p ranges over the first 10 primes. So here you can see, uh, don't worry about this number, here are the polynomial factors mod 2, I find uh, x, x plus 1, and x squared plus x plus 1. They're kind of buried in this little data structure here. So that's all built into SimPy. I wrote a little function to figure out the factor pattern. And if you look here, modulo 2, it factors in the pattern 1, 1, 2, mod 3 and just as a single irreducible polynomial, mod 5 is a linear polynomial times a cubic polynomial. This is what I had over here. The pattern was 1, 3 because the polynomial factored as a linear times a cubic. So here's the factorization pattern modulo the first 10 primes, sometimes 1, 1, 2, sometimes 4, sometimes uh, 1, 3 so far. Now I'm going to look at the factorization patterns for the first thousand prime numbers. This will take the computer just a minute. I didn't really program this efficiently. Uh, this could be done in probably a millisecond or something if I had done it efficiently. And what I find is that as I look over a range of primes here, I looked at a thousand primes, about a quarter of the time I find pattern 112, and about a quarter of the time I find the pattern 4. About a third of the time I find this pattern 1-3, about 4% of the time, so something I didn't see it, the polynomial will actually factor into four linear polynomials. And about 12% of the time I'll find the factorization pattern, which is the product of two quadratics. So now I want to show you what this all means in terms of group theory. So the possible patterns So the possible patterns I could find, well, there's, these are my degrees. So the degrees of the irreducible factors of this modulo of prime could be linear, 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 degree 1, 1, 1, 1. It could be degree 2, a quadratic, and then two linears. I think this happened modulo 2. I could find two degree 2s. I could find a degree 3 and a degree 1, or I could find that the polynomial is irreducible. And the frequencies with which these things occur, if I look at my evidence here, from the first thousand, I find about 4% here. So frequency of these patterns, if I look at large lists of prime numbers, about 4% end up here. Pattern 211 occurs with frequency about 24.1%. Fre the frequency of the 2 2 pattern is about 12%. The frequency of the 3 1 pattern, I call it 1 3 over here, is 34.4%. 
and the frequency of the four pattern is 25%, 25.6% here. What do these frequencies actually mean? Why is it more common, for example, if I look modulo some prime number, that this polynomial say, why is it more common that it stays irreducible than it factors into all linear factors? And why is it more common that it factors into a three cycle, sorry, not a three cycle, but a degree three and a degree one polynomial? Why is that the most frequent of all? And the frequencies end up being related to the conjugacy classes in S4. So this is kind of all ring theory and factorization. Let's look back at group theory. This is meant to be kind of a review. So this is all ring theory. Group theory of S4. In S4, I have certain cycle types. I have the 1, 1, 1, 1 cycle. And that's the identity element. So the identity element has cycle type 1, 1, 1, 1 because it's built out of these four one cycles. Another cycle type is the 2, 1, 1 cycle type. So for example, I have 1, 2, 3, 4. That's an example etc. How many of these are there? There's six of them because to give a two on one cycle I have to choose two elements out of the four and put them in a little two cycle together and there's six ways of doing this. The number of elements here, there's one element here, there's six elements here. I could have a double two cycle like one, two, three, four 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 4, 2, 3. There's only three of these. There's three double two cycles. Then I could have a 3, 1 cycle. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4 is an example. And there are, in fact, eight of these. These are the most common because to make one of these, I choose one element to leave out, and there are four ways of doing that. And then there are two ways of creating a three cycle out of the remaining three things. So four times two is eight, if you want to count them. And then I could have a four cycle. That's the last remaining way. So the four cycles are one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three, etc. And how many of these are there? Well, there's 24 elements in S4 and there's six elements left. So there's in fact six things here. What's the relation? So this side is purely group theory. This side was kind of ring theory in an experimental way. I factored a polynomial modulo a thousand primes. The relationship is that if you look at the number of elements here, these proportions match these proportions. Because remember, out of the total of 24 elements in S4, 1 24th belong to this cycle type, 6 24ths belong to this cycle type, 3 24ths belong to this cycle type, 8 24ths to this cycle type, and 6 24ths to this cycle type. Comparing these, 1 24th is pretty close to 4%, 6 24ths is a quarter, pretty close, 3 24ths is an eighth, which is pretty close to 12%, 8 24ths is a third, which is pretty close to 34%, and 6 24ths is a quarter, which is pretty close to 25.6%. And this was just using the factorization among the first thousand primes. If I had gone up to 10,000 or a million primes, these numbers would be even closer to these numbers. So this is a deep theorem. It's, it's called Chebotarov density, if you wanted to actually look it up. And it links together the factorization patterns that you would see if you look modulo various primes, you take a polynomial with whole number coefficients like this. If you look at the factorization patterns and how often they occur, they're precisely matched by the group theory in S4. 
And something like this will happen for every polynomial. Every polynomial has an associated group where the conjugacy classes in the group reflect the, the factorization patterns when you factor that polynomial modulo primes. A connection between number theory and ring theory on this side and group theory on this side. So I thought that would be an, a kind of a cool way to finish. I'll upload the little Python notebook so you can play with it yourself if you'd like to. And uh, it's been more fun than I thought actually recording these lectures. Uh, I'll send out an email blast soon with more information about the final. And uh, stay safe and have a good summer.